Thank you, Troy, and thank you, Ben. And thank you, Chris. In northern Israel, excavations were done on a city called Sepphoris. I, I think the I think my altitude is a little, uh, we may need to bring it down just a little bit. Yes, the city called Sepphoris was a thriving trade center, not far from Nazareth, where Jesus grew, yet, grew up, and yet it's not even mentioned in the Gospels or the other Christian writings. Dominic Crossan, who is known to you. Hi, David. David. Uh, and uh, David Housel. And uh, who is known to you as a contemporary scholar. And who I've, I've heard do presentations here. Theorizes that Jesus did not send his disciples into urban areas or go there himself to do his ministry, but focused on rural communities and specifically the homeowners there. Now, a clue to this is suggested by a brief reference in Luke chapter 10, verse 4. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and salute no one on the road. In effect, don't talk to others on the road. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your focus on staying in one place and getting to know the people. Verse uh, 7 of Luke 10, Jesus says, And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Or in other words, even though Mrs. Goldberg down the uh, lane makes the best brisket in town, you stay where you are and eat whatever they serve you, even if it's cheeseburgers, and be grateful. You can laugh at that. But there's truth in that. To keep the focus on building community. Jesus wasn't sending out homeless people two by two, but trained missionaries whose goal was to plant communities of faith. This was partly to mend the rupture between homeowner and homeless in that society caused by the extortionate taxation practices of the Romans and the Herodians. High taxes and fees forced ancestral owners into foreclosure, kicking them to the curb with their lands absorbed into estates owned by absentee landlords, managed by corrupt stewards, and cultivated by day workers, perhaps the original owners themselves. And so the disciples would have also met beggars, bandits, insurgents, and very bad potters, signifying from the archaeology of the time that simple pots and lamps were an easy way to turn a buck in a distressed economy. And all these different characters are evident in the gospel narratives and in Jesus' parables. Those first Christian missionaries would have known basic first aid for that era, they would have known how to pray out loud and how to lead songs and to sing. And they would have known Jesus' teachings and his parables and the foundation of those teachings. The blueprint of that beloved community of God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven was the Sermon on the Mount. And here now a retelling, a paraphrase of the Gospel of Matthew, chapters 5 to 7 including the Beatitudes. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And he sat down when his disciples had climbed up and were before him. And from his lips came this teaching. 
to be ripened are those who are challenged by poverty and disability, for theirs is the beloved community of heaven. To be ripened are those who suffer, for they shall be healed. To be ripened are those who are humbled, for they shall win it all in the end. To be ripened are those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they shall be satisfied. To be ripened are those who are merciful, for they themselves shall receive mercy. To be ripened are those who are pure in intention, for they shall see God in action. To be ripened are those who are peace builders, for they shall be called the children of God. To be ripened are those who are persecuted for the sake of justice, for theirs too is the beloved community of heaven. And to be ripened are those of you who be cursed, persecuted, and accused of all kinds of terrible things, uh, <coughs> falsely on my account. Rejoice and anticipate the great reward that awaits you in the heavens, for the prophets were abused in the same way. You all are the salt of the earth, and when seasoning becomes tasteless, with what shall it be made savory again? Why, it is good for nothing. But even then it can be thrown out on slippery walkways. You all are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and places it under a basket, but on a lampstand shining forth to all those in the house. In this way your light must shine forth in the sight of all humanity, that they may see your good works. And praise for your beloved guardian who is in the heavens. Do not assume that I have come to undermine the law and the prophets. I have not come to undermine them, but to affirm them. I tell you the truth, neither heaven and earth nor the least stroke of any letter of the law will pass away before everything that is supposed to happen does. Therefore, whoever makes a habit of breaking the law of love, the law of loving kindness, and convinces others to do the same, will have little to do with the beloved community of heaven. But those who practice as well as preach the law of loving kindness will be considered giants in that beloved community of heaven. For I intend you, unless your righteousness exceeds the literal interpretations of the Pharisees, you will not even enter the beloved community of heaven. You've heard that it was said to the ancient ones, thou shalt not commit murder, and murderers will be brought to court. But I say to you, anyone who festers with anger will be brought to court, and whoever calls someone by a dirty name will find themselves in prison. And whoever casually slights someone is already in hell. So before you bring your offering to God, while you're nursing a grievance, Leave your gift, reconcile yourself with that person, then return to present your offering. If you find yourself in a business dispute, be on good terms with your antagonist, otherwise you might find yourself in court and doing time in prison. Tell you the truth, the world will not let you get away without practicing, without paying back all that you know, that you owe. You've heard that it was said, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say to you, anyone who looks at someone else with lust has already committed adultery against that person in one's heart. So if your righteous eye caused you to sin, tear it away and, well, cast your sight down. For it is better not to be a spectator than to become a spectacle yourself. And if your righteous hand caused you to sin, pull it away and keep your distance. For it's better to keep your hands to yourself than for others to seize you. And it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him be authorized to do so. But I say to you, any man who divorces his wife, except for sexual disloyalty, puts that woman at risk in society. For there's unfair social pressure against a divorced woman in this world. Again, it was sent to the ancient ones, thou shalt not break thy word, and thou shalt keep thy pledge to the Lord. But I say to you, make no promises at all, either by heaven, which is the throne of God, nor by the earth, which is the footstool of God, nor by Jerusalem, the city of the great king. Could you presume to promise anything? For you're not able to turn even a black hair white. But say yes or no about what you did do. For beyond this, it is just quibbling. 
You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, lex talionis. But I say to you, don't hit your abuser back. With violence, that is. If someone were to backhand the right side of your face, turn so they'd have to strike the left side and risk being guilty of assault. If someone were to sue you for the shirt off your back, embarrass them with your nakedness by offering up your cloak as well. And if a Roman soldier forces you to carry his pack for a mile, go two miles and make a friend. Anytime someone asks you to give them something or to borrow something, don't turn your back on them. You've heard that it was said, and thou shalt love thy neighbor, and thou shalt hate thy enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy. Pray for those who mistreat you, so that you may become children of your heavenly guardian. For God has made the sun to shine upon the evil and the good, the rain to fall upon the just and the unjust. If you love only those who love you, isn't that its own reward? Even Thieves and traitors do this. And if you welcome only those who are like you, isn't that what extremists do? Perfect yourself in this way, by practicing God's perfect way of loving kindness. Now, don't let your righteousness just be for show to win favor with others. Otherwise, you'll have no reward from your heavenly guardian. Therefore, when you make your offering, don't toot your own horn like hypocrites do in the synagogues and public places for the attention. I tell you the truth, they have their reward. Instead, make your donation so that your left side doesn't interfere with, interfere with what your right side is doing. And though you make a donation anonymously, your heavenly guardian will know and reward you. When you pray, don't be like those hypocrites who love to make a big show of their prayers in the synagogues and public places for the attention. I tell you the truth, they have their reward. But you can pray even if you enter an empty room and shut the door. So pray in solitude, for your heavenly guardian will see and reward you. And when you pray, pray like this. Guardian of us all who is in heaven, let your name be respected. Let your beloved community come to be. Let your, des let your design unfold on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the bread we need and forgive us our failures as we forgive those who fail us. Do not abandon us to disaster, but rescue us from the evildoer. So now if you forgive others' transgressions, shouldn't your heavenly guardian forgive you? But if you do not forgive others, neither will your heavenly guardian forgive your transgressions. And when you fast, don't be like those gloomy hypocrites who grimace to make a big show of their fasting in the synagogues and public places for the attention. I am really telling you the truth. They have all the reward they're going to get. But when you are fasting, anoint your hair, wash your face so no one can tell you are fasting. And your heavenly guardian, except for your heavenly guardian who knows in secret, and your beloved guardian who sees you even in your hiding place will reward you. But do not presume you can hide your treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves can break in and steal. But store your treasures in heaven where moth and rust and thief cannot touch them. For where your heart is, that is where your treasure will be. The eye illuminates one's physical self. So if your eye is healthy, your appearance will shine. But if your eye is focused on evil, your outlook will be grim. And when gloom informs you instead of light, how sinister will that gloom be? You can't serve two bosses, for you'll hate one and love the other, or stand behind one and despise the other. You're not able to serve both God and greed. Therefore, don't be anxious about life. What you shall eat, what you shall drink, what you shall wear. Isn't life more than concerns about food and clothing? Do you see the birds of the sky? They neither sow nor reap nor gather food into barns, yet your heavenly guardian feeds them. Are you any less significant than little birds? And can any of you extend your life a day longer by worrying about it? 
Now, why would you fret about clothes? Think of flowers growing in a field. They neither spin nor weave, yet not even Solomon was arrayed as magnificently as they are. And if God has adorned such wildflowers, which are growing in a field today and tomorrow, are cut down and thrown into a fire, how much more so will God adorn you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, don't be anxious about life, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? Aren't these the things materialists strive for? Don't you think your heavenly guardian knows that you need these things? For our search for the kingdom the, for, of the beloved community and the righteous ways of God and all these things will take care of themselves. So don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will have its own concerns. Today has challenges enough. Don't prejudge if you don't want to be prejudged. For the scrutiny with which you scrutinize others will be used to scrutinize you, and the maneuver you give will be the same you get. Now, why would you notice a speck in someone else's eye, but ignore the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, take the log away so that you can see clearly enough to help someone else. But don't give sacred things to hyenas. Don't trust your treasures to swine, for they will trample them in the mud and break your heart. Ask and you will receive, seek and you will find, knock and the way will open up for you. For everyone who asks will receive, everyone who seeks will find, everyone who knocks will find their way. If your children were to ask you for a loaf of bread, would you give them a stone instead? <laughs> if they ask you for a fish, would you give them a steak? Even if you all were evildoers, you would still know not to know to give good things to your children how much more so will your heavenly guardian give you good things when you ask for them therefore what you wish others would do for you you should do so for them it's the sum of the law of moses and the prophet's teachings so enter the narrow gate rather than the wide and easy way that leads to disaster though there are many who choose that Boy, how narrow the gate and difficult the road that leads to authentic life, and how few find it. Beware the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inside are ravenous wolves. You will know them by the outcomes they produce. You don't get grapes from thorns and thistles. Likewise, you expect tasty fruit from an apple tree and nasty fruit from a crab apple tree. A healthy tree does not produce rotten fruit, and a rotten tree does not produce healthy fruit. And any tree that does not produce healthy fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. You will know them by the harvest they produce. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the beloved community of heaven. It will only be, be those who do the will of my heavenly guardian, which is simply which is simply to, here's your part, which is simply to love. Try that again. Simply to love. Great. <laughs> Many will come to me on that sunrise to eternity, saying, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do many mighty works in your name? I will say to many, but not all, you never really knew me. Be gone, you lawless, you loveless opportunists. Those who hear my words and follow them will be like the wise person who built a house upon rock. And the rain came down and the river rose and the wind blew against that house and it did not fall because its foundation was upon the rock. And those who hear my words and do not follow them will be like the foolish person who built a house upon sand. And the rain came down and the river rose and the wind blew against that house. And it all fell down and its collapse was complete. And as Jesus finished speaking, the multitude of people were amazed at his teaching for he did not preach at them like their religious experts, but spoke to them as one who has authority. 
You've heard that it was said one way, but I say to you, God is still speaking. So don't pray, donate, serve just for show, because God is with you wherever you go. Therefore, do unto others as you've had the, have them do unto you. Or else. narrative. Listen with openness. Question civilly. Stay engaged. Act nonviolently, but with intention. Speak up. This is the challenge to reclaim the Christian mission from those who would domesticate it to serve authoritarian, authoritarian powers. I recently heard an online talk by another contemporary Christian author, Brian McLaren, who warned about the fallacy of biblical inerrancy. Many Christian communities encourage blind trust for inerrant authorities and infallible hierarchies. They drive away critical thinkers, doubters, they support leaders with authoritarian and narcissistic tendencies. They form a cluster of authoritarian followers and deliver them as fervent voters to authoritarian leaders and parties. The teachings of the Sermon on the Mount stand in direct contrast to this kind of two-dimensional literalist faith. Ironically, the Sermon on the Mount is literally a three-point sermon. It not only calls us into dynamic engagement with society, but also calls us into an active dialogue and cooperation with God. You've heard that it was said one way, but I say to you, God is still speaking. So don't pray, donate, serve just for show, because God is with you wherever you go. Therefore, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Or else. In the first point of the sermon, chapter 5, Jesus reinterprets some of the commandments without causing the least stroke of the, of the letter of the law to pass away. Instead, he models how laws have to be understood for their underlying purpose by using the litmus test of rational loving kindness, essentially truth and love as the law or the will of God. Rather than limiting human behavior, Jesus seeks to redirect it into life-giving ways. For example, the punishment for acting out anger is initially the same for murder, and consequences become more severe as aggression becomes more routine. But that is precisely what Jesus seeks to correct. The casual indifference of a thoughtless oath is evidence of habitual depravity. Jesus comes down hard on divorce, but his focus is nothing sentimental about the tradition of marriage, but on the catastrophic effects on women, and therefore children, who are universally vulnerable in society. The late theologian Walter Wink discovered in a Bible study with gang members in Harlem that turning the other cheek was the kind of jujitsu that takes away the position of moral authority from an oppressor to creatively resist without violence. The way of interpreting that text historically led to the successful strategy and tactics by Martin or by Mahatma Gandhi and Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in their respective quests for liberation, for liberty for freedom. Their application of Jesus' teachings to love your enemies proved to be the E equals MC squared of social transformation. The second point of the Sermon on the Mount is devoted to recognizing the reality and relationship of God with us. 
prayer, fasting, and donations that are done out of conformity or calculated for praise are empty actions if a person's heart isn't in it. The heart is where the treasure is or ought to be. That is where God lives in each of us. If we cultivate our hearts, keep our eyes focused on goodness rather than gloominess, and choose God over greed. The third point is traditionally understood as judge not lest ye be judged, but then goes on to tell us how to judge. This passage is really a warning against prejudging or prejudice. It is the a text to refer to of, of condemning prejudice, racism. And that we had better, oh, and, and just the other expressions of that, of this prejudging and scapegoating and labeling and categorizing and dismissing people. Now this pas passage is really a warning, uh, as I said, of prejudice. And that we had better, though, make good choices to avoid hyenas and swine, wolves in sheep's clothing, rotten trees with their rotten fruit, and those who say, Lord, Lord, but misrepresent the one who is the Lord. Jesus began the Sermon on the Mount with the Beatitudes, which serves as a roadmap for those who would follow Jesus on the way. It is a cyclic path of overcoming oppression with a hunger and thirst for justice, mercy, purity and intention, peace building, and courage to face persecution. Jesus then shares two parables of salt and light, two imperishable elements of life on earth representing the imminence of God. Life is not something we go through alone, whether we know it or not. You've heard that it was said one way, but I say to you, God is still speaking. So don't pray, donate, serve just for show, because God is with you wherever you go. Therefore, do unto others as you have them do unto you, or else. And let the people say, Amen. <laughs> well, friends, I invite you now to silent reflection. Consider what you've heard. And we listen past the sounds of the room, and past thoughts that would distract us for that quiet place where God always waits. O oh God, deliver us. Deliver us from the pandemic of virus and the epidemics of violence and addiction. O oh God, bless everyone here in their respective journeys and struggles, their concerns and celebrations of life. We pray for healing deliverance, reconciliation for any challenge of body, mind, or spirit. Oh God, we are at a inflection point in the life of our society. The whole world is burning with ancient rivalries 
and no less here. And we ask you for decisions that are being made and that need to be made. As we are reflecting on environmental rights, abortion or anti-abortion rights, Miranda rights, voters' rights, gun rights, the right to life, free of violence, gay rights. We pray for the freedom that we have been given, the heritage of freedom we have been given. The freedom of, of expression. The freedom of religion. The freedom from want. The freedom from fear. Oh God, I pray that you encourage each person here to know their narrative of belief, what they fall back upon, so that they can listen with patience, question civilly, stay engaged, and be prepared to speak up when that's called for. And oh God, may all of us do as your disciples had done as they were doing what you had been doing to drive out evil spirits of fear, deception, and hatred, to heal people in their distress of body, mind, and spirit, and to plant the seeds of beloved community, communities of faith. These things we pray in Jesus' name, and let the people say, Amen.